is in attendance. Thanks, Bud. So this is a coast-wide board. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to run through the list of names again from north to south, so bear with me. Um, and some of these names I have not even read out loud to myself before, so if I butcher your name, I apologize in advance. Starting with Maine, Megan Ware. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Steve Train, not hearing anything. I'll mark Steve as absent. Senator Miramont. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. New Hampshire, Cherie Patterson. Here, good morning. Thank you. Richie White. Present. Thanks. Dennis Abbott. I know he's here, Max. Let me just... He's self-muted right now. Okay. We can circle back to Dennis. Continuing on with Massachusetts, Nicola Meserve. Present. Thanks, Nicola. And Max, Dennis has his, Max, Dennis has his mic on now, so you, he should be able to speak. I'm present. Thank you, Dennis. Ray Kane. Present. Thank you. Representative Peek. Hearing none, I'll mark Representative Peek is absent. Uh, Rhode Island. This is Ray Kane. Uh, Sarah Ferrara is her proxy. She should be on. I'll text her. Thank you her very right much. Now. Sarah Ferrar. Here. Thank you. To Rhode Island, Connor McManus. Here. Thank you. David Borden. David, you're self-muted, so you need to unmute yourself. And it looks like he's trying, Max. Okay. We'll circle back. Eric Reed. Yes. Thanks. Connecticut, I have Justin Davis. Thank you. Bill Hyatt. Present. Thank you. Senator Miner. Mark Senator Miner is absent. Jim Gilmore, New York. Here. Thank you. Emerson Hasbrook. Here. Thank you. John McMurray. I'm here. Thanks. Moving to New Jersey. Joe Semino. Present. Thank you. Tom Fody. Here. Thanks. Adam Nawalski. Present. Thank you. Moving to Pennsylvania. Chris Kuhn. Present. Thank you. Lauren Lustig. Good morning, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Warren Elliott. I'm present. Great, thanks. Delaware now, John Clark. He might be muted by the organizer. Hold on. He does not have zeros, Dustin. John Clark, can you hear me? He's unmuted, so he should be able to speak now. John Clark might be having audio issues. He is. Okay, moving on. Roy Miller. Present. Thank you. Craig Pugh. Here. Great, thanks. Moving to Maryland. Lynn Fagley. I'm here. Thank you. Russ Dyes. Here. Thank you. Allison Colden. Present. Thanks. PRFC, I have Marty Gary. Here, Max. Thank you. Now to Virginia, Steve Bowman. Here. Great. Brian Plumley. Might be muted. Nope. Brian, you are self-muted if you're trying to speak. I will circle back to Brian. Senator Mason? Here. Thank you. North Carolina, I have Steve Murphy. I'm sorry, Senator Brian Plumley here. Great, thanks, Brian. Steve Murphy? Here. Thank you. Jerry Mannon? Here. Great. Mike Blanton? He's not in attendance. Hearing none, I will mark absent. 
South Carolina, Mel Bell. Here. Thank you. Senator Cromer. Hearing none, I will mark as absent. Malcolm Rhodes. Here. Thank you. Georgia, Doug Hamans. Here. Thank you. Spud Woodward, I know you are here. Representative Rhodes, hearing none, I will mark as absent. To Florida, Jim Estes. I'm happy to be here, Max. That's great, Jim. <laughs> I have uh, William Orndorf, hearing none, I will mark as absent. Representative Altman. I'm here. Thank you. And from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Mike Millard. I'm here, Max. Thanks, Mike. And from National Marine Fisheries Service, Derek Orner. Yeah, hey, President Max. Great, thanks. So do we have resolution for John Clark? We're working on it right now. John, I sent you a a message and call the number I just sent you. Do we have resolution with David Borden? David, David is self-muted. He just needs to unmute himself. He might be on the phone or away from his computer maybe. I don't know. I know he has sound though because he did speak earlier. Okay. Other than those two, Mr. Chair, uh, we have full attendance. Everyone's been accounted for. Thank you, Max. Um, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, to join this, uh, I guess, first ever webinar-based meeting of the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board. Um, whenever I uh, decided to uh, accept the nomination for vice chair and chair had no idea that we would be in the situation that we're in now, but we will certainly make the best out of it. So uh, please bear with us. Uh, we might have a few technical difficulties, but we will get through them. Our, uh, we have an agenda before us. Um, are there any uh, recommended modifications to the agenda as presented? Just raise your hand if you, if you have a recommendation. Joe Cimino has his hand up, Spud. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a request to uh, add something during other business, just a, an item for discussion. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. All right, will do. Thank you, Joe. Um, any other changes to the agenda? I do not see any other hands up. All right, then we'll accept it by consent. Thank you. Our next agenda item is the approval of the proceedings from our February meeting. Uh, everyone should have had a copy of that. Um, if there are any changes, uh, modifications, corrections, uh, please raise your hand so that we can get those on the record. I do not see any hands up. All right, then we will consider the proceedings accepted by consent. We have a pretty simple agenda for our meeting this morning. We have really one, one item, and it's an informational presentation by Dr. Mancieri, and it is a follow-up uh, to the motion to postpone at the February meeting uh, on the acceptance of ecological reference points. And just a little reminder, uh, we have a motion uh, made by, John, by Megan Ware, seconded by John Clark, that passed the ecological reference point work group with some specific uh, actions to evaluate uh, the ecological reference points models. Um, so what we've got this morning is a presentation uh, to provide us information on the results of that uh, analysis that you requested. So I assume that Matt's on board and ready to go. I am. All right, very good. Well, you, you have the helm. Can you all see my uh, presentation? Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Matt Siri, and I'm with Maine DMR. 
Um, I'm the Ecological Reference Point Working Group Chair, um, and I'll be providing you today with um, uh, an updated analysis based around um, the board's charges from what seems like a lifetime ago, the February meeting. All right. So just to give you sort of an outline uh, of where we're going today, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, go over some of the additional uh, analysis um, suggested by the board, give you some of the results associated with uh, that analysis, um, go over some of the uncertainties, some of the next steps um, in the process, <clears throat> as well as some questions and wrap up. <clears throat> Before moving on, it might be useful to just simply go over the terms of references um, that the board um, wanted to look at while we were going through the benchmark. Um, so these are the more pertinent <clears throat> terms of reference um, associated with uh, the benchmark. And these included to develop models to estimate population parameters um, that take into account Menhaden's role as forage, and also to develop methods to determine reference points and total allowable catch for Atlantic Menhaden that account for Menhaden's role as forage. Just to give you sort of a more introductory um, information, um, <clears throat> at the end of the benchmark, um, the uh, uh, Ecological Reference Point Working Group recommended a combination of both the BAM single species assessment and the NWAX mice model as a tool to help evaluate trade-offs between menhaden harvest and predator biomass um, and to establish quotas. So as you guys probably remember um, what, what we in the group call the, um, the rainbow plot um, shows um, striped bass biomass here on the y-axis. I'm sorry, striped bass F here on the, on the y-axis, menhaden F here on the X, um, the current striped bass F target here at point two, the Menhaden uh, current F um, here uh, as of 2017 in the dash line. Oops. Um, there's higher striped bass uh, amounts uh, as abundance here in population size down near the zero zero mark near the origin. And as you move up to the um, uh, up to the right, fewer and fewer striped bass. The the solid lines here represent B target, and uh, I'm sorry, B target and B threshold. So, at the end of uh, the benchmark assessment, as we uh, uh, presented in February, the ERP had um, developed example ERPs. Um, these were based on um, Menhaden um, to, uh, uh, men, I'm sorry, a maximum F for Menhaden that would uh, sustain striped bass at their B target when striped bass were fished at their, B uh, at their F target. Um, and then we um, uh, had an example ERP threshold of the maximum F on Menhaden that keeps striped bass at their B threshold when striped bass are being fished at their F target. Um, and in that um, example, all other ERP uh, species were fished at their status quo or 2017 levels. And hopefully you guys sort of remembered this uh, particular graph. Um, here we have uh, striped bass uh, B over B target. So basically, a stripe. If this is at um, at one, um, bio, uh, striped bass biomass is at B target um, here, and then the threshold value here in this dashed line. And what you can what you can see is um, in the gray. We have the current status quo F for Menhaden, which is down here. The ERP target is in this green solid line, and it's where this relationship line between striped bass and Menhaden crosses the B target. We also have the same thing for the threshold in which this dashed line here 
is where this relationship um, line crosses the B threshold. And then we have the single species um, uh, uh, BAM targets and BAM thresholds here in blue, with this being the target and this being the threshold. Hopefully that's a little bit of a refresher. So at the end of that sort of, um, of the work that we presented in February, um, we had defined sort of an ERP target and threshold based around um, that graph that I just showed. Um, and this sort of gives you an idea of the F target in that example um, was uh, 0.19 with a threshold of 0.57. And the current F, um, as estimated uh, in 2017, was 0.16. So to meet the current uh, striped bass management objectives, the F target and threshold for Atlantic Menhaden should be lower than the single uh, than the single species target and threshold, and that the current F is below the target um, ERP uh, target and threshold indicating that the stock is not experiencing overfishing. So at the end of that meeting, um, the board um, tasked the ERP workgroup with conducting, conducting additional runs uh, of the NWAX MICE tool to explore some different sensitivities to ERPs under different assumptions of ecosystem conditions. So these were the um, additional analysis that the board wanted to see. Um, they included all other species fished at their um, 2017 status quo levels. Um, this is the example ERP that we presented at the winter meeting. Um, the additional, uh, another run was that all species were fished at their target um, that allowed them to reach the target biomass. Um, third was that all species were fished at a level um, at an F level that would keep them all at their biomass threshold. And for a fourth, it was to have Atlantic herring and bluefish only fished at a rate that allowed them to reach their biomass target, while spiny dogfish and weak fish were fished at their status quo levels. And speaking of status quo levels, this is pretty much what we're talking about. Um, for status quo, what was used for the, the 2017 status was that Atlantic herring was not overfished. It was below its target, but not yet overfished. <clears throat> Bluefish <clears throat> was both overfished and overfishing occurring. Spiny dogfish was below its F target, but above its SSB target. And for weakfish, that the total mortality was too high and its status was depleted. <clears throat> now, to give you sort of an idea of um, the this sort of ecosystem, um, ecosystem scenario sort of laid out as a table, um, here is each one of the examples from one to four. For example, here's the ERP um, examples that we showed in February. Um, and then here is scenario two, scenario three, and scenario four. And this is um, each of the species um, <clears throat> and their F target um, or um, status quo or F threshold. So it's important to note here um, that for some of the stocks involved, um, the F target and F threshold <clears throat> were defined as the F rates uh, within the NWAX mice model that would let these species approximate their targets and thresholds respectively. So what this means is, in some cases, for example, for bluefish and for Atlantic herring, um, the F in the model was set at something different than what is in the management plan to allow these stocks to achieve either their B target or their B, or their B threshold as, a, as appropriate. <clears throat> so going over some of the results. So what you can see here is um, we have this, the first scenario, um, the example ERPs that were uh, presented in 2020 winter meeting, um, and we have the targets and thresholds that I went over a little bit earlier. And down here, we have the probability of exceeding the ERP target using a quota of 216,000 metric tons um, 
which was uh, what was being analyzed. And this gives the probability that that quota will um, exceed the ERP target uh, in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And as you can see, the relative probability is 60%, 71, and 66. Also, we have the probability of exceeding this particular ERP threshold, um, and that is in 2019 through 2021 is zero. For scenario two, all of the stocks at biomass target, um, and just sort of to sum up here, the negative aspects of rebuilding bluefish and, and spiny dogfish and weakfish as competitors here um, was outweighed by the rebuilding of Atlantic herring, which serves as sort of an alternate prey source. Um, here, the ERP threshold ended up being undefined, um, which I'll explain in a minute. So if striped bass was fished at an F target and Atlantic herring biomass approached its biomass target, increasing F on menhaden wouldn't actually um, drive striped bass to its threshold over the ranges of F that we explored. And so this is scenario two. Um, note that this is our F target under this scenario for ERP. And the probability of exceeding that using this 200,016 200, uh, um, uh, quota um, was very, very low through 2019 through 2021, and just about zero um, for 2019 through 2021 for the threshold. So for scenario three, kind of the opposite, um, everything um, at its biomass threshold rather than its target. Um, some of the positive aspects of reduced competition on striped bass were outweighed by negative aspects of lower Atlantic herring biomass. Um, you can see the ERP um, threshold and targets here. Note that the target is um, like a tenth of what it was in the previous example. Um, here, the F threshold was defined, and you can see that the probability of exceeding uh, a target with 216,000 metric tons um, is very high, around 100%. The probability of exceeding the ERP threshold, however, was relatively low, um, zero in 2019 um, and about 13% in 2020 and 2021. So for scenario number four, this is with Atlantic herring and bluefish at their target biomass. Um, this is nearly identical to scenario two, um, everything at target. Again, negative aspects of rebuilding bluefish are outweighed by rebuilding of Atlantic herring. Um, and as you can see, the F targets is pretty much the same. Our F threshold uh, ERP is still undefined very low probability of exceeding the ERP targets and almost no probability of exceeding the ERP threshold. So just sort of to sort of sum up and wrap up um, some of the results. Again, here are our scenarios. Here is the ERP target from each one of the examples. Here is the ERP threshold. And note, um, here is our example at 119. Um, for scenario two and scenario four, the ERP target increases uh, above um, the ERP example, um, but declines for, um, uh, for scenario three. And note that the ERP thresholds are undefined for scenario two and for scenario four. So, it's important to note that when Atlantic herring are at their biomass and striped bass were fished at their F target, again, the ERP threshold was undefined. And I'm gonna show you this uh, as graphically in a second. So, so this is similar to the plot that I showed earlier um, with the blue and the gray uh, dotted lines. And as you can see, the status quo, um, the example ERPs are here in the gray. Um, and you can see um, 
um, this relationship line between um, striped bass uh, biomass and Atlantic uh, menhaden F um, crosses the the B target and the B threshold, just as we talked about earlier. When everything goes to biomass target, um, you can see we get this sort of straightish line. Um, so when Atlantic herring is actually at, at a fairly high biomass, you actually, over the uh, Atlantic Menhaden F that we um, evaluated, you actually never get to this B threshold line. When everybody is at their biomass threshold, you can see that the line um, moves down and to the left here in the blue, and it crosses um, the B target for striped bass much um, closer to the origin, as well as when it crosses the B threshold. And you can see for bluefish and Atlantic herring at its target biomass, they're, again, right on top of each other with um, the, the results from scenario two. So into a lot of rainbow plots. Um, so I'm going to go over um, these rainbow plots. Each panel um, is each one of the scenarios, scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, and scenario four. Striped bass full F over here on the y-axis, men hidden full F down here, um, and the, um, the horizontal uh, dash line here, um, that's your striped bass F target, where it crosses here in B target and B threshold, here in, for example, in the example ERPs, this is going to be um, your ERP target in this um, vertical dash line and the threshold. So moving from status quo, scenario one, to everybody at their biomass threshold, um, you can see that high stripe biomass is down near the origin in purple lower stripe biomass here in the red. Um, and you can see that that line ends up getting pulled downward, right? So the ERP target under this um, all at biomass threshold, scenario three example, is really, really close to the origin. Um, and the threshold is you know, moved a little bit to the left. And it's always, a, a for me, I always find it useful um, to look at where these lines intersect. So you can see that um, when everybody is at their threshold, um, the ERP targets and thresholds move a little bit to the left. Going over here to everybody at its biomass target, you get sort of a different sort of um, a picture. For one thing, your, um, your ERP threshold ends up becoming undefined which means that it never, uh, that at um, a striped bass F at its target, it never quite gets to its B threshold, um, no matter what F that you actually look at. Um, you can see in general that, um, uh, um, of course, um, striped bass tends to be a little bit, there's not a lot of red associated with this, and the line actually ends up becoming um, a little bit more horizontal. And again, for um, scenario four, exactly the same picture as um, uh, scenario two, um, where you see that, you know, it again doesn't cross the B threshold. So we're going to look at the results for bluefish. So we've kept the lines exactly the same, sort of a, um, an F target for uh, striped bass as well as um, an F target for um, Atlantic Menhaden. And here the colors indicate um, the abundance of bluefish. And as you can see between panels one and panel three, there isn't a whole lot of difference. Um, there's not much change. Everything's pretty much red, um, which indicates that uh, bluefish are still going to be overfished. Going on to panel two um, and panel four, however, they're pretty much the same thing. 
you can see that there's been a dramatic change in bluefish, um, and that's because you know bluefish under that scenario um, aren't you know they're fully rebuilt um, above their BMSY proxy, and so you can see what that looks like. Um, note that at stripe bat, at a stripe bath uh, bass F that's at its target um, and um, a menhaden F near its target, you can see that we're looking at stripe uh, at bluefish biomasses, you know, approximating, you know, uh, 1.2 um, as opposed to 1, so above its um, biomass um, target. <clears throat> And the same similar type of a plot for weak fish. Um, again, the the color and the um, and these <clears throat> contours here um, uh, represent weak fish biomass. Again, striped bass target F on the vertical um, line dash line, um, and the ERP target in the uh, the dashed um, line that's on the um, uh, I'm sorry that's on the vertical. And what you'll see is that there's not much change among any of these particular panels. In fact, um, none of the none of the surface plots, none of the stuff that we did, seem to affect weak fish um, uh, a lot. So those are our results. Um, uh, I now want to go over a little bit of the uncertainties. Um, the stocks here were fished at rates that allowed them to sort of approximate their biomass targets or thresholds. Um, and this isn't this isn't going to line up um, with the values from the FMP, particularly for federally managed stocks. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. In order to, to get these stocks, you know, to their biomass targets or their thresholds, um, required in some cases, you know, a little bit lower F um, than what we see in the FMP. And part of that is a result of of using a you know an EWE of using the NWAX mice model um, to predict things. And also um, um, the sort of discrepancy between that and single species assessments. Weak fish under any of the scenarios that we did didn't rebuild. Um, in keeping with a lot of the high natural mortality uh, that the recent um, assessment has suggested. And um, that this M wasn't really something that we could attribute, attribute well to the predators or prey um, within, the model, uh, within the modeling structure that we looked at. So as you probably gathered, um, the relationship between Atlantic Harry and striped bass was really, really strong um, and was sensitive um, in the model estimates based around herring vulnerability. The model's response um, to herring uh, predicted a higher consumption of Atlantic herring um, at high biomass, and this was a little bit more than what we had expected. While we understand that herring is probably an important component of striped bass diets, um, we felt that the model may be overestimating the importance of Atlantic herring on a coast-wide basis, especially on an annual level. Um, and as we get into next steps, we think that there's more work needed around this particular relationship. Um, it seems to be that you know the relationship between striped bass and menhaden is somewhat attenuated by um, the biomass uh, of Atlantic herring. So for next steps. Um, we want to look at some additional analysis before the next board meeting. Um, and these include exploring alternate herring biomass scenarios. Um, and this is particularly relevant given the uncertainty of, of Atlantic herring recruitment. Um, Atlantic herring, like, like Atlantic Menhaden, um, are a recruitment-driven stock. Um, and there might be some uncertainty in the future about um, recruitment events. And so it might be a good idea to take a look at potentially lower herring biomasses and, and how that might affect the ERPs. Um, we also really want to explore the sensitivity of model parameterization for Atlantic herring and striped bass relationship. I think this is particularly important. Um, we do think the model may be overestimating the importance of, it, of Atlantic herring. We know that they're important, um, but we're not quite sure they're that important. Um, so we do want to take a look at some of the parameterization, particularly look at some of the seasonal components associated with that. And we also want to explore um, scenarios in which some of those um, ERP focal species are fished at their actual single species F reference points. 
um, to see whether or not, for example, rebuilding of Atlantic herring or for bluefish is possible without having to tweak um, the Fs further, further uh, down um, compared to what's in the, the federal FMP. <clears throat> and for that, I want to. <clears throat> after that, I want to thank um, all the other uh, collaborators on this project, everybody on the committee, and um, take your questions. All right. Thank you, Matt. That was a very informative presentation. It's a complex issue, and you have done a great job of distilling it down uh, in terms that most of us can understand. Uh, before we get into questions, I just want to make sure that. Uh, we've got David Borden and John Clark back on audio. If y'all would both chime in, let me know you're there. David, you should be able to speak. You're self-muted right now. If you just unmute yourself. Yes, I'm here. Okay. How about John? Uh, we might have to unmute him one second. And go down and see. Dustin, you may be able to find him faster than me. He's unmuted. John cannot hear you. I cannot hear you, John. His you microphone is green, so he shouldn't be muted by any means. It's maybe something on his end with uh, his software or um, computer. Okay. Well, we'll hopefully continue to work on that. In the meantime, if you have questions for Matt, uh, just raise your hand and get in the queue, and uh, Tony will be uh, bringing you up. Okay. Um, for the queue, I have um, Lynn Fagley, then Allison Colden, John Murray, Justin Davis, Nicola Meserve, and Emerson Hasbrook. So, Lynn, you're up. Allison, you're on deck. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. I counted to 10 before I raised my hand, hoping that I wouldn't be first. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, Matt, for this um, presentation. As always, it's an it's a incredible amount of work. I, I guess I have one question and one um, comment or request. And the first is, um, to, when I saw this, the results were pretty counterintuitive at first blush because of the fact that when we went to this scenario where everybody is at their biomass target, the reference points went way up. Or to say it another way, you could very much liberalize your fishing on Menhaden if in the scenario where everybody's at their biomass target, which is not what I expected. And I understand that the reason for that is because if you rebuild herring, it really doesn't matter what you do to Menhaden. If your objective is that Menhaden are not limiting to striped bass, that objective is met solely by putting a lot of herring out there. So, what that does is it gives us a situation where on one of your slides um, earlier in the presentation, it says to meet the current striped bass management objectives, the F target and F threshold for menhaden should be lower than the single species target and threshold. So what I'm saying is it's a little bit counterintuitive that we suddenly have an ERP that is much greater than the single species reference point. And I would question, I would question that it's at all realistic given the fact that we're probably not going to get herring back to its target biomass anytime in the near future. And given that the F that was used in the simulation or in this analysis is the F from the NWAX model, not the FMSY that the herring, you know, the herring's managed under. Um, so I guess my question is how, how do we reconcile what would appear to me to be in this unrealistic uh, um, influence of herring, that's one. Two is, is there any scenario 
where uh, an, an ecological reference point for Menhaden could realistically be higher than the single species reference point. And that leads me to my third, and I know this is a lot, I'm sorry, that when we get to discussing these next steps, I would certainly like to understand for the outcomes of each of these next steps, what is the management utility of those for the board? So for example, if we, uh, for the first bullet, explore alternate Atlantic herring biomass scenarios given the uncertainty in future recruitment, I think we know if we have continued low herring biomass, those ERPs are going to look pretty different. I mean, to me, that kind of seems obvious, so maybe I'm missing something. So I think it's important for the board, because this is so complicated, and because we could really start to travel down a rabbit hole, it would be good for us to understand for each of these next steps, what are the discrete pieces of information that the board can then take and apply um, to its next uh, management decision. And thank you for your patience. That was a lot. Okay, where do you want me to start first? I guess start with the, with the question about um, the influence of herring and whether a, um, the, the question about the striped bass objective and whether an ERP could realistically be higher than the single species uh, reference point. And theoretically, yeah, theoretically it can, right? Um, one of the things that, you know, when you start, when you start looking at um, ecological-based fisheries management is you, when you start drawing in multiple different species as predators, of course, you also have to start drawing in multiple different species as prey. Um, and so there is the ability within an ecosystem for predators to swap from one, from one small silvery fish to another. Um, I think that the, the ERP work group shared your concerns about the, the importance of Atlantic herring. Um, and I think part of that is actual, actually, you know, um, a, a, you know, a seasonal um, a difficulty within the model. Um, I do think it's something that we need to work on. And I think it's something that, um, that I think we're, that we've outlined as, a, as something to look um, to, to do more sensitivity runs around. Um, and to see if we can sort of look at the vulnerabilities. You know, that said, Atlantic herring is an important component of striped bass diets, particularly um, in certain times of the year and in certain locations. Um, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too surprised that adding in um, alternate prey items into the model um, would change your reference points. Um, but I but I agree. I, I don't think Atlantic herring probably is as important as the model is currently portraying it. Um, and that's something that we want to work on. But it is certainly very possible that you can get ERP um, uh, reference points that are less conservative than um, a single species, particularly if you've, um, um, if the estimate of natural mortality within a single species model is quite a bit higher than what you would, re than what you would expect um, from from an ERP model, particularly if, if you allow for prey switching. So that's, I think, your first question. So for yep. your second question, sorry. No, you're good. Sorry, go on. So what was your second question? Sorry, I'm going to break this down because I'm not sure if I can remember from <laughs> one explanation to another. Your yeah, second question? I, yeah, I apologize. The second one just really... Um, you know, we can wrap it up. It just had to do with the management utility for each of these next steps. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's important to understand that, particularly for federally managed species, you know, by law they have to be rebuilt. Um, and and so you know, I mean, I know certain species can languish below their their BMSY or the BMSY proxy, um, but long the long term federal management is to have Atlantic herring and bluefish at their BMSY proxies. And so, I mean, it's not unreasonable. Atlantic herring, you know, prior to this recent um, difficulties in recruitment was at and actually well above its biomass target for decades. And so I don't think it's un <clears throat> unreasonable to assume that that is the long-term place where Atlantic herring is going to be managed at. Um, I think, 
the sort of trade-offs between um, you know Atlantic herring biomass and menhaden um, removal is something um, is something that the board has to sort of examine in their um, in their risk uh, appropriate approach. You know, do they set ERPs that account for lower herring biomass? Um, even though Atlantic herring is probably going to go end up going back to its BMSY value, um, that's a that's sort of a risk reward um, calculation that the board has to do. Um, but what I think is is really important is I think we do need to take a look at at some of the biomass scenarios which don't have herring quite as rebuilt as above BMSY, um, which you guys can then use as as sort of a, a proxy to give you an understanding of of what happens if herring isn't rebuilt or isn't rebuilt in a timely enough fashion um, to to mitigate your risks. Is okay, that about right? Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, I guess uh, Allison, you're up next. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Matt, for that presentation. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Matt, I want to just um, follow up to Lynn's question and explore the the um, next steps around the herring biomass a little bit, and then I have one other question. Um, do you expect? I think the way you just described it was somewhere in between. Um, you know, not quite rebuilt. So do you expect any of the herring scenarios that you would explore would fall outside of the scenarios that are already included between scenario two and three with herring at its threshold and herring at its um, target? I think that's something that we can discuss as a work group. Um, we can certainly put some in there for things that are lower than than the herring threshold. <clears throat> um, I do, I do want to reiterate that for those that are, aren't really familiar with the Atlantic herring um, FMP and Amendment 8, um, herring F goes fairly quickly to zero. The 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 fur, the furthest further below the threshold that they get. Um, and so it, it, the, the fishing actually comes to pretty much a grinding halt, um, um, not much further past the F threshold, according to Amendment 8. And so I think um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see sort of a, um, a thresh, uh, uh, an analysis that was too much below the threshold, but it is something that we can do um, if, that's, if that's something that the board would like to task us with. Okay, and you do you mean that the F comes to a halt when biomass dips below the B threshold, or are you referring to the F threshold? No, the B the B threshold. So it okay. literally it literally declines to um, to zero um, as you move further and further below uh, F uh, B threshold. Okay. Um, and the other question I was hoping you could talk through or clarify a little bit is um, going back to the risk probabilities that were projected for each of the scenarios. I don't know. Yeah, if you could pull those up, I think that'd be helpful. Um, so for the example ERP at the beginning when you were reviewing the results, you showed that the um, 2017 F rate was very close to the ERP target F. Um, and so I'm just trying to reconcile that with the example ERP probability of exceeding ERP target of 60 to 70 percent. So could you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. Um, as you guys might remember from the single species assessment, um, Menhaden are projected to go down slightly. Um, um, you know, from, from 2009 through 2021. Um, and this just sort of reflects that, 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 ER, that, um, that this particular quota um, at 216,000 metric tons sort of gives you a, a probability um, here in 60, 71, and 66. I think it's important to understand that for the ERP example, um, that it was assumed that striped bass would be at its F, uh, at its B target, um, and we all know that's not really the case. 
it's probably closer to its um, B threshold. And so, um, but if striped bass were at its B target, these were the pro this is the probability that you would get um, if it if it had, um, you know if if striped bass was at its its target. Um, I don't know if Katie wants to sort of chime in if there's something that she would like to say as well. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I just wanted to also add to that that the the F of two of 0.16, that's approximately the ERP target, is the F from 2017 where we had a lower TAC. And so the 216,000 metric tons does represent a slight increase from where we were in 2017. Um, and so that also contributes a little bit to like the higher probability of exceeding the ERP target in this scenario compared to um, sort of where we were in 2017. Thank you. All right, Tony, who's up next and who's on deck? We have Justin Davis with Nicola Meserve on deck. All right, Justin, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'll just start off by thanking the working group for continuing to produce this really great work. I, you know, just continue to find it really interesting and you know really demonstrates that this ecosystem approach is sort of performing as advertised that it's presenting a uh, a way of making sort of quantitative decisions you know trade-offs uh, evaluating trade-offs around management decisions for multiple species i've got a question about a way that i'm sort of interpreting um, scenarios two and four relative to scenario one that i'd like to see if uh, matt agrees with I think one of the motivations for this board asking for these additional scenarios was that the scenario one presented back at the winter, winter meeting assumed uh, status quo F for bluefish and herring when we knew that this commission and, and some of our federal partners had taken actions to relax F for those species, to decrease F. And so I remember at the winter meeting kind of asking a question about, well, what does it mean if we set an ERP that assumes status quo F but we know that we're making an attempt to reduce F. Does that mean we're setting the ERP too conservatively or not conservative enough? And my interpretation, looking at what's presented here in scenarios two and four, is that you could look at scenario one as essentially a very conservative approach to setting the reference point, given the uncertainty about the success of the management initiatives to reduce F on bluefish and herring and initiate rebuilding. Uh, both scenarios two and four suggest that were we to successfully rebuild bluefish and herring, and I think this is primarily due to herring, that sort of in retrospect we could have fished Menhaden less conservatively, but that if we do not have success in rebuilding herring and bluefish, that essentially scenario one reflects uh, an appropriate fishing mortality for Menhaden if we essentially have very little success in the near term in rebuilding those species, we will at least be fishing menhading conservatively enough to achieve our management goals for striped bass. Does that sort of match with your understanding, or is that a is that a realistic way to interpret these results? I, I think it's I think it's uh, it's an appropriate way of interpreting some of the results. I think. Um, the ERP, the ERP that we gave as an example is is one in which you know sort of incorporates the current um, status of Atlantic herring, bluefish, spiny dogfish, and weakfish. Um, so that's 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 a pretty that's a pretty safe it's a pretty safe bet. Um, uh, again, I would sort of go back to um, you know what I what I said earlier, long term. I think the goal is to have Atlantic herring and bluefish rebuilt um, as part of the, you know, the federal management process. Um, but having having said that, I, I believe you're correct. All right. Thank you, Justin. And Nicola, you're up. And who's on deck? Emerson Hasbrook. And four. All right, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and to Matt as well and the ERP for doing these additional analyses for us, which uh, I agree with everyone, you know, helps us get a better idea for how the example ERP is per, you know, has the potential to perform. 
Um, I have a bit of a question about um, the timeline. Um, the, the assessment with the ERPs was obviously met with a great deal of anticipation from the managers and the public alike in terms of when we could implement um, an ERP. And uh, we're looking at potentially you know, another delay in adopting an ERP with some additional tasking to the work group, which looks very worthy to me. Um, however, I wanted to check that um, we still have the potential for a, a timeline where the board could be adopting an ERP such that it could be used to set a TAC in 2021. Uh, so that's my first question. And then the, the second part would be um, whether the ERP work group, you know, expects if they're tasked with these um, additional analyses, you know, if they expect to be in a position of you know, reaffirming its recommendation for the example ERP um, or potentially changing that to some other uh, recommendation. So I'm going to let Max or staff actually handle the first one as far as timeline. Yeah, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> um, Nicola, I would say that definitely uh, is there is an opportunity for the board to set attack for 2021 with new ERPs. Um, that timeline is not impacted here. You want to start thinking about moving down that road soon. Of course, if you wait till October, for example, that, that might present some challenges. But as we stand right now, that timeline is not impacted. Thanks, Max. And, and for the second one, I, I think we can under our next steps, um, I think we can have some of that analysis, or I think all of it, frankly, um, done by the August meeting, um, provided uh, Dave doesn't kill me. Um, but having said that, we've we've already had discussions around some of these um, over email, um, and some preliminary runs have been done, which we have to bring back to the group. So I do think that we can have some of these explored um, by the August meeting. And maybe I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball a little bit here, but do you expect that those additional analyses will lead you to a position where you have a, a recommended ERP, whether it be the initial one or some iteration of it? I'm, I'm not quite sure we're, I'm not quite sure we will ever recommend something. Um, we will present you the information and allow you to make your own choices, as always. All right, that's fair. Thank you, Matt. Um, if I could just follow up, um, I would say that, um, you know, I think the, the work group has done a great job here again. Um, and they're basically asking us to recommend, to, to, to task them with some additional analysis that's going to help us um, take the work that they make um, and select a select an ERP to move forward with. Um, so it's my hope that the board will task the ERP work group with the three um, specific analyses that are in it, in the memo and have been presented in the presentation today, um, and and report back on that work at the August meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And, and we'll we'll address those next steps uh, once we uh, handle all the questions. Uh, Emerson, you're up. Who's on day? Tony? We have John McMurray and then Sheree Patterson after Emerson. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Matt, for your presentation. And thanks to the working group as well for all the work that they've um, put in this. Um, <clears throat> Matt, um, in your in your um, presentation, you'd mentioned that the relationship between Atlantic Atlantic Herring and striped bass um, is very strong. That the relationship between striped bass and menhaden seems to be influenced by Atlantic Herring, um, and that adding in alternative prey species may also result in a higher F for menhaden's point. So. To me, as a biologist, that just means what we kind of know with striped bass anyhow, that they're very opportunistic feeders, and they're going to they're prey on 
on you know whatever is in abundance and whatever is is easy for them to uh, um, uh, uh, to prey on. So I'm wondering then why you think that the model may be influencing um, herring dependence uh, with striped bass rather than just actual biology. That's my question. Thank you. So, so when we went through and we looked at this, we were we were a little bit surprised. Um, the diet data doesn't seem to line up with this level of dependence between striped bass and Atlantic herring, <clears throat> as you as you as you're well aware of. While there, while a good chunk of striped bass is in the Gulf of Maine exposed to Atlantic herring in the summertime, and as well as much of the population in the winter on the winter feeding ground, um, this was. There wasn't as much diet data to back up um, the relationship between striped bass and Atlantic herring as there is for striped bass in Menhaden, um, and so I think this is something that we really need to look at. We we believe that there's probably a seasonal component um, that's probably really important that we want to explore further. Um, but let's be frank: the overlap between striped bass and Menhaden is a lot stronger than the overlap between striped bass and Atlantic herring. So while, while we do think it's important, we think that this looks like it might be a little bit more important than, um, than we had initially seen from the diet data. And so we want to explore it. Uh, good, good. Emerson, any follow-up? Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The only follow-up I might have is, um, I'm not sure what the what the diet data is that uh, Matt is referring to, and where those samples were collected. You know, are they distributed pretty evenly up and down the coast, or were they taken primarily in those areas where striped bass and menhaden overlap? A little, a little bit of both. Um, but I will sort of point out that one of our biggest uh, contributors of diet um, for striped bass is um, at least um, one study done by Gary Nelson, who, who works at a mass DMF, um, who documented a lot of herring and menhaden um, uh, in the diet of striped bass in the Gulf of Maine. And the other is the, the Northeast Fishery Tri uh, Science Center bottom trawl survey. Um, which also takes a lot of guts as well as the, the, the VIMS biomass survey. So there's a lot of information that goes into this model. Um, uh, within the SOC assessment, you can, you can take a look at, the, at the, the, the whole suite of information that we've brought into this. And, and um, after a, a very large and lengthy comprehensive look at almost all the diet studies that have happened um, on the U.S. East Coast for the last 30 years, um, we we felt that there wasn't as much data to back up that sort of very strong relationship um, between Atlantic herring and striped bass as it would be for for menhaden. So, got one follow up, please. Go ahead. Um, could it be then that um, in the model that Atlantic herring? Um, presents itself possibly as a proxy in a way for some of these other alternative prey species that are not included in the model. No, I don't. I don't think that's really the case. We we really did isolate um, the. Uh, if you go through if you go through the assessment report, we isolated um, the major components of uh, of the ecosystem, and we even had a broader ecosystem model, um, the full model, which sort of gave. Um, the the information that we needed to sort of hone down this information, and so no, I don't think I don't think that the model is forcing um, striped bass consumption on herring as a result of not including other aspects in, of the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. All right, John McMurray. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. You guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, so I might be getting ahead of the conversation here, but uh, everything that's been set up to now implies that we're planning on uh, just to keep tinkering with inputs 
questions have all been technical and frankly a little difficult to follow. My question is the working group planning on producing a simplified summary decision document with three or four options that the non-science folks and the public might actually be able to understand. And, uh, you know, we've worked on this an awful long time, and I think the expectation is to, to make a decision in August. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it'd be useful to have something like that, you know, a week or two in advance of the August meeting, and I'm just wondering if that's the game plan moving forward. I'll defer to Max. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Well, this, um, yeah. yeah, I was, I, I was going to say maybe Katie should jump in and answer this okay. one. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you. This is, this is Katie. Um, and yeah, I think that's definitely the goal of what we would want to do is we want to make sure that when we, when we come to August, people feel kind of comfortable understanding the performance of this model and the potential um, ERP options. So we're not necessarily, you know, recommending, oh, this is the right option because obviously it depends on kind of how the board wants to assess risk and manage risk. So for example, that threshold scenario says that you have to forego Menhaden yield in order to um, keep striped bass at its target or its threshold when everything, when herring or alternative prey species are at their threshold, as opposed to the situation where herring is at its target, um, as opposed to the situation where um, herring and other species are kind of continue at their status quo level. So what we want to provide is sort of a range of different um, these are sort of the different effects that you get in different ecosystem considerations and different management scenarios. And it's up to the board to decide how risk averse they want to be or how conservative or not conservative they want to be with Menhaden. But the goal is definitely to kind of provide the, the range and the understand the limits and the sensitivity of the reference point so you can understand here's how the example ERP performs under this set of, set of assumptions compared to some of these other assumptions. And then the board can decide what's the most reasonable um, ecosystem to try to manage to either in the short term or in the long term. And so our goal is definitely to provide um, as, as accessible a document as possible to the board and to the stakeholders to help understand this tool. There are certain decisions that we can't make for you, like how risky you want to be um, or how conservative you want to be with Menhaden, but we can help you understand if you want to be more conservative, here's the reference point that you're looking at and how does that relate to um, a less risky alternative alternative or a more risky alternative. And so for sure, when we come to the board in August, we can show you all of this information. But I think you guys then have to be in a place where you're ready to make a decision or ready to understand how risky um, or how conservative you want to be. Mr. Chair, can I ask a follow-up question? Go ahead. Uh, so just to be clear, the intent is to provide those options in advance of the August meeting so that commissioners can make a decision in August, because I, I think that's what the public is expecting, and I think we, we have to be clear about that goal now. Yes, so our intent is to complete all of the work that we have suggested. So we've identified certain areas that we feel are uncertainties that we want to really flesh out from a technical standpoint so that we can be confident in the information we're giving you in August. Um, you know, obviously, I don't think we can control the commissioner's concerns or uncertainties or things like that. So if you get, if people come to the board and say, oh, I want to see more work, oh, I want to see more work, that's, uh, you know, a board decision. And, and certainly you guys can have that discussion. But our intent is to provide as structured and as accessible a document as possible before the August board meeting with materials or supplemental materials so that you can, you um, see everything that we've sort of recommended to be explored, laid out for you, and understand the range and the sensitivity of these reference points, and understand sort of some of your options or considerations for levels of risk or uncertainty, and then can make that decision if you, the managers, feel that you're ready to go forward at that point. That's useful. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I, I was going to speak to this later, but since it's sort of come up, I'll go ahead and address it now. But uh, it is certainly my intent as your chair 
to bring us to a decision point in August, whether that's a in-person meeting or a webinar meeting, which uh, none of us know at this point. Uh, but yes, at some at some point we, we have a we have a motion in limbo that has been postponed that has got to be addressed, and we've got to move this forward. So it is certainly my intent to get us across the finish line uh, and to do whatever is necessary as preparatory work. So that whenever we do have that August meeting and whatever format it is, that everybody is at a point where they can make a decision. Uh, okay, Sheree, you're up. Anybody else in the queue? And then we have Roy Miller and Justin Davis does have his hand up. I don't know if it's, I think it's a new question. Okay, well, I certainly don't want to stymie questions, but uh, we are already 17 minutes over time and I don't want to cut into anybody's lunches. So we'll, We'll do the best we can, but uh, certainly just ask everybody to keep your questions uh, succinct on, on point. So we've got uh, Sid Roy, and then who else? Um, and then Justin after Cherie. Um, but I also wanted to let you know that there are two members of the public that have had their either raised their hands or sent in a question. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, Cherie, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Matt. Every time I get more information, I gain more information from your presentations, and I really do appreciate all this hard work that you and the work group have done. Can you go to the last slide, please? And, Mr. Chair, I would like um, to entertain a motion. When you feel it is ready, I understand that you have additional questions. Uh, potential technical questions beyond me, and then if you care to come back, I can make a motion. Uh, yes, I'll tell you what, if you'll just, just uh, hold that and let's see what else we've got, uh, but I'll certainly uh, get, get back to you on that. That's okay with you. All right, I assume so. Okay, Roy, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I assume you can hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. So everybody else can. Um, just very quickly, this relation, this strong relationship between Atlantic herring and striped bass, Matt, uh, being higher than expected, I wonder, um, I'm assuming that we're referring to female striped bass biomass primarily rather than total striped bass biomass, or I may have that wrong. Is it total striped bass biomass? Are the males included? Yes, the males are included. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if we're getting a um, misleading picture, knowing that Atlantic herring are not terribly abundant um, in Delaware Bay and in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and male striped bass, because of their delayed migrational habits, are, are much more dependent on, on the Atlantic Menhaden than they would be on Atlantic Herring. And, you know, I just, I wondered if, if that was the reason that, that this strong relationship between Herring and Striped Bass might throw us off track a little bit. Um, and w we should look at that since in the uh, producer area portions of the range of Striped Bass, we're basically talking about Menhaden and not Atlantic Herring. Thank you. I think I think it's important to <clears throat> to note that that the EWE model, the NWAX model, doesn't really have the ability to do spatial resolution. Um, we can probably do something looking at some temporal resolution, um, although that's something that we've only discussed as recently as a work group. Um, but the frame to look at um, for the NWAX model is coastwide across the entire year. Um, and so drilling into anything more specific, either by particular sexes or in particular areas, um, is just not possible with this type of a modeling approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ray. All right, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a bit of a process question that's possible Cherie's going to address this with her motion, but at the last meeting, uh, the motion to postpone was sort of until a certain time, and the, and the motion said 
that we were postponing until the working group came back with the results of the analyses that they presented today. I'm just wondering if this board needs to take some affirmative action to postpone the postpone motion again until August, or if we can just at least do that via sort of board consent and get it in the record, even though uh, you know we don't, we don't have a button here for nodding your head. We can't just look around the room and see if that's the consent of the board, but I'm just wondering if we need to get it in the record that we're postponing that motion again. Uh, good question. Good question. Max, you think we need to uh, go on record as saying that the, the motion continues in postponement? Um, I'm going to look to Tony or Bob on this one, but my re initial reaction is that we don't need any motion here, that it was a commission leadership decision to make this particular board meeting informational only. Um, but I, again, defer to Tony or Bob to chime in or correct me. I think that because the um, work group still had uncertainties with the analyses that they presented, they're, I would say that they're, um, the information being presented is still in situ, and that until we have the additional work from them, you can consider the motion still postponed. But if you want to put it on record, Spud, you could say that, or what I have said is on record. Yeah, I think your explanation is, is adequate as is as Max's, but I appreciate you bringing that up, Justin. We want to make sure we don't get ourselves cross space. Okay. Uh, any other questions? If not, I'm gonna to go to Cherie. Anybody else in the queue, Tony? Right now we just have members of the public that are in the queue. Okay. All right. All right, Cherie, I'm back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, like to make a motion that the board task the ERP work group to continue with analyses to address the list, listed recommended um, scenarios before the August board meeting. All right, very good. Do I have a second? If so, just raise your hand so you can be identified by a Tony. We have Nicola Mazur with our hand up as a second. Okay. I'm sure it's hard to understand you. You're breaking up a lot. Task the ERP work group to continue with analyses to address the listed recommended scenarios before the August board meeting. Uh, well, Maya um, gets these. Um, because this is a TC tasking, um, you could try to see if anybody disagrees, if you'd like to, instead of calling the roll. Um, commissioners could raise their hands by disagreeing, I guess. Um, we, we don't always yes, do that was, that, TC taskings. That was not my hand. <laughs> All right. Uh, is this, is this your motion, Sheree? Is this accurately portrayed? Do you make any changes? Yes, that's fine with me. Thank you. All right, so we have a, uh, a motion before us uh, to pass the ERP work group to continue with analysis to address the listed recommended scenarios before the August 4 meeting. Is there any opposition to the motion as presented? So raise your hand. We don't see any raised hands, and we will consider it supported unanimously, and uh, we will move on. But real quick, Justin Davis, you do have your hand raised. I don't know if it's left over from before. Okay, he took it down, so I think it was just okay. left over. Very good. All right, motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Katie. 
Uh, we appreciate the, the appreciate the questions from everybody. All right, we're going to move on to other business. Uh, Joe, you've got an item you want to bring before the board. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to Matt and the ERP for all the work they've done, as well as the SAS and TC to date on getting us all this important information. Uh, those of us that have been dealing with Manhattan for a while know that past peer reviews, plural, not just the most recent, um, have pointed out that despite the volume of surveys used and reviewed for our assessments, you know, we still lack a survey designed to target Menhaden. And both the peer reviews and the CIEs have pointed out that there needs to be a sampling of larger, older fish that are sampled across the range. So there is a Salt and Saul Kennedy grant um, that is a proposal that's out there right now that, that does intend to do that to some extent. It's a hydroacoustic survey with principal investigators from the Chesapeake Bay Lab of University of Maryland, as well as co-PIs from VIMS and Normandale, <clears throat> industry collaborators from Cape May, New Jersey, since this is a mid-Atlantic uh, survey design with industry's assistance and federal partners from National Marine Fishery Service at the Beaufort Lab, uh, the Northeast Fishery Science Center, state partners with New Jersey's Marine Fisheries Association. And this hydroacoustic survey, you know, is, is, a, is a chance to get field confirmation of overwintering adult menhaden in the mid-Atlantic region, which could shed some light on the existence of spawn or biomass um, in the offshore wintering areas. Uh, it's an important component of our needs for the assessment. Um, I believe that the board would benefit greatly if the TC was able to review the uh, both, well, the survey methodology, both from the proposal as well as from um, a peer review article put out by Drs. Liang, Nestledge, and Wilberg from Chesapeake Bay Lab um, that we can provide for the technical committee. Um, I would hope that, you know, I have personally three specific asks for the TC um, that they would do a, a review of the survey design uh, to assess the magnitude of the overwintering Menhaden biomass off the coast of New Jersey uh, to gather biological samples on older fish in the northern portion of the range and also reviewing it and providing uh, information on if it's a, a decent index of relative abundance in the region if this survey was able to be conducted long term. So I just wanted to put that out there for uh, board consideration as a, as a task to the TC. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, anybody have any questions for Joe on this? Uh, since it is a tasking recommendation that we do not have to consider in the form of a motion, uh, unless there is some uh, great concern about this. Uh, if so, raise your hand and if you have questions or anything, I don't, Tony? I don't see anybody with their hand raised um, okay. except for a member of the public, but that person has had their hand raised for a while, so I think it was on other issues. Okay, we'll get to the comment in just a second. So, okay. Uh, seeing no concerns or uh, opposition to that, then Joe, we will certainly uh, get your recommendation to the technical committee. Any thanks. All right. Well, we are uh, 30 minutes past our cutoff time. Uh, we've got another uh, board meeting coming up shortly. Uh, folks need to have lunch. Uh, we have two people in the queue for public comment. Uh, I will accept that public comment, but we're going to need to keep it brief. So uh, three minutes uh, for public comment. If Tony, if you'll just kind of help me keep up with that, please. Uh, and who's who we got up for public comments? Will do. Um, Steve Bowman did just raise his hand. Um, so before we go to the public, do you want okay. to go to Steve? All right, Steve. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very, very brief. I just want to take this opportunity on the behalf of the Commonwealth of Virginia Y'all may know, and most people do know, but I just wanted to get it on the record that uh, we appreciate the patience of the commission through the past uh, almost two years 
as we have dealt with the compliance issue with the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm just pleased to report to this board, if you did not know, that the General Assembly of the Commonwealth of Virginia transferred control of the Menhaden fishery from the General Assembly to the Marine Resources Commission. Uh, at its April 28th meeting, the Marine Resources Commission unanimously adopted a regulation that brings Virginia or uh, has Virginia adopt the uh, amended cap um, as it relates to uh, Menhaden. Uh, I just want to thank everyone involved, um, the commission for their patience during the time of patience the commission for their resolve, because if it were not for the resolve of the commission to move forward, I believe with the last motion that put Virginia out of compliance, we would not have been in as strong a position as we were as we move forward to attempt to uh, have control move to VMRC. Uh, and on top of that, after that occurred, I'd like to thank the stakeholders that were involved recreational fishery and industry, and the Northern Administration, Governor Northern and Secretary Strickler, and all who worked very, very diligently to get us where we are today. I think that removes one less element of conflict that we will have to deal with as we move forward to manage this fishery in a productive manner. So I just wanted to get that on the record and thank you all very, very much for your patience, your resolve, and your assistance. and. Uh, I know we're going to be moving in the right direction. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Steve, and, and, and kudos to you and, and your team for uh, for your persistence and, and trying to get this uh, this situation resolved. Uh, I think we're all much happier now of where we are versus where we were. And as you said, it's one less uh, point of conflict for us to deal with as we try to move Manhattan management forward. So. All right, uh, with that, uh, public comment, Tony, what have we got? We'll start with Jim Uphoff. Jim, I'm unmuting you. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That was just a mistake. I was pushing the wrong button. I apologize. All right, all right, very good. All right, we'll mute you. Um, Tom Lilly, I'm going to unmute. Tom, you are not connected, so I won't be able to unmute you. Tom, you should have received an audio pin from the webinar. So if you could enter that on the phone, do the pound, then the three-digit key, and then the pound, that should let you be unmuted. And everyone I guess, should have received the written comment from Mr. Lilly. So we do have that. Tom, in, Tom, in order for you to speak, you have to enter an audio pin of 688 pound. Uh, still hasn't entered it yet, Spud. All right. Well, in the interest of, of moving on, we've got uh, ACCSP at one o'clock, so we're already impinging yep. on people's lunch time. So, uh, I say we do have some uh, written comments from Mr. Lilly. I'm sure his verbal comments would be uh, basically uh, condensation of some of those. So, uh, sorry about that, Mr. Lilly. But we, you know, we're we're in a bold new world here, and it comes with some some technical difficulties. So, um, are there any other business to come before the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board? I do any not see hands any hands raised. Raised. no hands are raised, bud. All right, very good. Thank you, thank you all for your patience for uh, for making this all work, and uh, we're all optimistic that this is a temporary situation and. Hopefully we can be back face to face for our next meeting, but uh, if not, uh, we, we will keep things moving. And uh, as always, I'm available if you have questions and comments, things that, uh, that will help me in my job as chairman, don't hesitate to let me know. And with that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, sir.